mash in the front, and that's what created the compression fracture. So that's why. It's a lot better now, but I just feel more comfortable if I get up off that. I still don't as much as I used to, but I still get some tinges from just the very You know, the change. Yeah. You know, but generally thing to do. I'm sorry. I, I had no way of calling you all in the middle of the night. I don't think you'd want the phone call anyway. Um, I apologize, but we're going to get started now. Ms. Manashi, you ready to proceed? Doctor, remember, you're still under oath. Yes, sir. <laughs> I am. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I know some time has passed, so it's hard to pick up where we left off, but I'm going to give it my best effort here. Okay. Um, I want to circle back, if I can, um, to your fee agreement in this case. I know you had mentioned um, the initial contract you had with the prosecutor's office uh, when you were first retained. Do you remember that uh, yes. line of questioning? And you had indicated that you had submitted an invoice for $10,000, correct? Correct. And that invoice was for work done up to and through um, the date of your report. Is that fair to say? Yes, 20, 20 hours. 20 hours. And the date of your report is March 3rd of 2020. Is that correct? Yes. So I want to break down the 20 hours. Uh, and it's 20 hours because for out-of-court work, you get paid $500 an hour. That's right. Uh, how long do you estimate that it took you to dictate your report? I really don't know because I did it as I went along. So I would review a case and review the details of it to where I felt like I understood what had happened clinically with that person, and then I would dictate the report. And so I did not keep a, a, a log of, of each individual time and add those up. I just did it over a period of time and did, a, did the report one, one patient at a time. And fair to say that the report, uh, as it was done, which covered 25 patients, was in length 36 pages long. Does that sound accurate? Yes. And the uh, font on each page is, is seemingly less than 12 font, if, if, if you would agree with me on that. I, I don't know what the font size is. It looks like about 10 to me, 10 okay. or 11. But it's 36 pages, and there's a lot of words on a page. Yeah. Um, and we know from your uh, direct examination when you were here uh, last Monday that you had met with the prosecutors down in Nashville um, for approximately four hours. Right. And that is also part of the 20 hours that you would build on this case, correct? Right. And then we know that you were provided 25 patient files, which you also reviewed as part of that 20 hours. Is that right. correct? Yep. So I want to drill down on, uh, we've got the four hours with the prosecutor, so that leaves us with 16 remaining hours. Um, I know you can't say with certainty, but uh, fair to say I could, I could estimate two hours in total. Okay, that's fair. And so we're down to 14 hours of time. Yep. With that, uh, I want to I go now to the medical records. Okay. So in this card, I would represent to you, <laughs> it's 14 binders because now you know that your testimony is limited to 14 patients. Is that fair to say? Yes. But at the time, you not only had these 14 patient binders to review, but you had an additional nine patient files. 
Right. And just so we're clear, if, if anyone's counting the binders, there are patients such as Joanne Bellasari that have like two binders. Yeah. And a substantial number of pages in each binder. Yeah. Not really, no. That's not accurate. Okay, and it's not accurate because my math is wrong? No, your math is good, but what you have to understand is that I don't do this for a living, and I feel guilty for charging the full number of hours that I actually spend on this work. Um, $10,000 was just the maximum amount that I could, in good conscience, bill for this. So I spent way more hours on this than 20 hours. It takes, Doctor, an, it takes an immense amount of time to go through these. Uh, yeah. If I can interrupt, you didn't agree to do this case pro bono, correct? No, I asked for $500 an hour. And in addition to $500 an hour, as part of your contractual agreement, was any time in court was $750 an hour, correct? Yes, this is the only time I've ever been in court, but that's what I decided ahead of time would be uh, time and a half for court. So I've never done this before. And your uh, pro bono, you understand that means that for free. Right. Yeah, I understand what the pro bono means. Okay. So you signed a contract with the state of Ohio for that five hundred and seven fifty, and then you signed a second contract, did you not? Yes. And the fee cap on that second contract is it not thirty thousand dollars? Yes, but I don't, I don't, I don't care what the fee cap is. Yes, I guess it's thirty thousand dollars. I don't okay. even remember what the fee cap is. Well, you jet the contract, right? You signed, correct? Yes. So with that understanding, uh, and, and maybe I, let me just be clear so that we're clear. In your report, your 36-page report, um, you indicate, do you not, that um, the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office asked you to evaluate the care of 25 patients treated by Dr. William Husell in the intensive unit in Mount Carmel Health Systems, period. Yes. <clears throat> showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 30. Fair to say, nowhere in your report, nor on the front page of your report, do you indicate how much time you spend on any or all of the medical records that you were provided. True. That's correct. Correct. Since you were last here, um, did you have an opportunity to spend additional time with any of the prosecutors on this case and, and talk no. about your testimony? No. Did you have an opportunity between the last time you were here and today to communicate with the prosecutors about those mistakes that you had made in your report and maybe getting them corrected? No, I did not do that. Did you uh, do any follow-up research or reviewing additional medical records between when you were last here and today? Uh, no. I was rushing through um, some of the patients last time, and, and I want to make sure that I take the time that each, each deserves. So I'll start with... Sandra Castle. And what I'll do every time is I'll put the page from your report up okay. um, just to reference it initially um, so that uh, you, you know it's there. Okay, so we're going back to some patients that we already did. Uh, actually, I left off with Sandra Castle okay. when we were concluding, um, and I have some additional follow-up questions with respect to Sandra Castle. Okay. So showing you does, uh, State's Exhibit 30, um, this is your summary of your review and conclusions with respect to Sandra Castle. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, just want to make sure that you understand and recall, based on your review of Sandra Castle's records, that the decision that her family made to palliatively extubate her was made on the day shift. Okay. Yes. 
you remember that? Yes. Okay, so Dr. Husel had nothing to do with the decision that was made to palliatively extubate her. Yes. Okay, and so then, um, and you, if you remember, then um, I want to go here <laughs> to your indication, this line right here where you indicate her prior pain was effectively managed with less potent opioids, medications more appropriate for the elderly patient population. Do you see that last sentence of the paragraph? Yes. Okay, we're gonna talk about that. Okay. I'm assuming, as part of your review of uh, Ms. Castle's medical record, that you had an opportunity to review the MAR, the Medical Administration Record. Yes. So I want to go through, based on that statement about her prior pain was effectively managed with less po potent opioids. Let's go through her MAR together if we can. Okay. Showing you what's been marked as Joint Exhibit 12, page 885-886. Right. Appears to be Sandra Castle, would you agree with me? Yes. Okay. Uh, admit date is 11-10, discharge date is 11-13, just to orient us. Right. All right. So let's go down here. Um, it appears, does it not, that on 11-10, um, Dr. Hagris orders 50 micrograms of fentanyl for her? Yes. Which is a very standard dose. Sure. I do remember, though, from your testimony that 25 micrograms to you was a standard dose. Well, 50 is, 25 to 50 is very standard. So now 25 to 50 is standard. Yeah, those okay. are both very standard doses. So then tell me, we have then on the uh, next page of the same exhibit, we have another order of fentanyl. You would agree with me, same day. For, uh, what was the previous time? Sure, let me flip back. 135, okay. Uh, 11, okay. <coughs> 423, do you see that? Oh, 423, I was looking at the time above that. That was the admit time, okay. Okay. Um, and it's ordered, that 50 is ordered as an IV push. Do right. you see that? Yeah. And you see that the ordering doctor there is Dr. Haggis. Right. And you see that this appears at, to be uh, 4 a.m., is that fair to say? Yes. So this is the night shift? Yes. Want to go to the second page of the same exhibit? Same date? 11.10? Right. What's it say right there, doctor? 100 micrograms. Who's the doctor on 100 micrograms? Hagris. So now we have 100 micrograms. Yes. Same day. Right. She's received 50 and now 100. Correct? Yes. Okay, and we know that this is the MAR, and so this is the medical administration record, which means that the medicine has actually been administered to the patient. Would you agree? Right. So we've got 50 plus 100. On 1110. Now I'm showing you, oh, and let me go importantly. We've got Dr. Hagris um, as the ordering physician, and pain scores noted as what? 10. That's on the 50. On the 100, IV push. Right up here when it says pain relieved with medication, speaking of the 50, what does it indicate there, doctor? Yes. And, and then another 100 is ordered. Right. 1110. Showing you what has been marked as joint exhibit 12. And what time had the patient been made DNR, by the way? Okay. You don't get to ask okay. questions. It, it, that might be relevant. Okay. Well, it may be relevant, and Ms. Sawyer will have an opportunity to talk to you about that, okay. but she, these are her questions. Okay. okay. Show me what's been marked is Joint Exhibit 12, page uh, 894. 986 to 899. Okay. And judge, for the record, I've already talked to the prosecutor about this. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to go here now. Uh, would you agree with me? This is another MAR. So this is this is uh, medication administered. Correct. Yes. We've got um, 1113. So this is a different 
day. Would you agree? Yes. And here we've got 50 micrograms of fentanyl ordered right. by Dr. Hagris. Right. And an IV push. Correct. And what does it say right here with respect to Ms. Castle's pain score? Eight. And I ask you this because in your report, you indicate that her prior pain was effectively managed with less potent opiates. Correct? That's yes. what you put in your report. Because of the word yes when he asked, was it working with you before? Then I want to go to the second page, same exhibit, 1113. 1634 versus 1114 or 1344. What's this indicate right here? 100 milligrams of fentanyl IV push. Milligrams or micrograms? Oh, sorry, micrograms. Uh, IV push, so another 100, so 50, 100. And who's the uh, ordering physician on this? A deer. So a second physician has given Ms. Castle 100 micrograms of fentanyl IV push. Is that correct? Right. And pain score with respect to this order with a different doctor is noted as what? Eight. And on the CPOT score that you talked about in your direct examination, uh, max is eight, right? The most pain is eight. Right. Which does coincide, does it not, um, with this nurse's note that indicates pain dash severe. That's right. I want to go now to the third page of that same exhibit. Order of uh, morphine. Do you see this, doctor? Yes, four milligrams of morphine, IV push, pain score nine. Pain score nine. And this is on 1113 at 1750, correct? Right. Then looks like, does it not, that 43 minutes later, more morphine is ordered, four milligrams, correct? Right. Um, because, as it's indicated, the pain is still an eight. Right, and this is like, that would be equivalent of 40 of fentanyl. Right, so she's, so and since you brought that up, on the 13th, she's had 50, 100, 40, 40, and then let's go here. Morphine, at 19.03, so approximately 30 minutes later, she gets 10 milligrams of morphine. Does she not? Right, which is 100 of fentanyl. Okay, and so I just want to make sure you also note that these uh, orders for morphine are from which doctor? Dr. Adair. Actually, I think right here it says Mahoney, does it not? Mahoney, okay. Okay, order Mahoney MD. Do you see that? Mahoney yeah, maybe MD? maybe a nurse or nurse or something. Okay. And then, pain still severe after even the 10 milligram of morphine that follows those other orders, right? Right. Then we go to that next page, 1113. Same day, another order, would you not agree, for 10 milligrams of morphine IV push. Do you see that? Yes. Still, even with that medication, 30 minutes later, what is the pain noted as uh, by even a different nurse now? It's severe. And the score? A nine. Going to the last page of that exhibit, same day. 2221. Another 10 milligrams of morphine. Right. Pain score. Same pain score. Right. IV push. Right. Pain's indicated as what? Severe. Pain, nine. So about every half an hour, she's getting more morphine. Yes, and that's very appropriate and standard. Okay. Well, I bring it up because every time she's getting more morphine, the pain has not subsided. Yet in your report, you state her prior pain was effectively managed. Do you not state that? Yes. And you know, because there's 
so many do documents, this sometimes happens. I missed another mar for Sandra Castle. Okay. Showing you Joint Exhibit 12, page 902 to 903. We're now going back, if you will, back in time to 1110. Do you see this as a fentanyl order? Yes, 200 mics. Tell me what that order is again. 200 mics of fentanyl. I was looking for the pain score. I don't see it, but uh, yes, by Dr. Hakers. Okay. Is it 200 or what does that say? Oh, there? sorry. Well, does it say 2,000? It sure does. Okay. Uh, it says 2,000 micrograms, but it is, is it not ordered to be dosed out per hour? Do you see that? Yeah, it's a, it's a 50 mics per hour dose. It's not a 2,000 mic dose. It's a 50 mics per hour dose, which, as I said earlier, is a very standard way to dose fentanyl. Right, but let me, let me go to what's next. At 2.55, so an hour later, what's ordered there? He increased the drip from 50 an hour to 75 an hour to stay on top of the pain. Right, because the pain was not managed based on the MAR with just the 50 an hour. Correct? This clinician clearly effectively judged that she needed That's not my question, more. doctor. So, yes. The 75 was a raise from the 50. Yes. And, if, and 75 is more than what you've testified previously as to what is in your standard practice, right? So this, is, this is very standard practice. Oh, so you're using 75 and 100 now as well? Now, remember last time I said that we go up gradually to stay ahead of the pain. So if we start at 25 and we feel like we need more pain medicine, we can go up to 50. If the 50 isn't judged adequate, we can go to 75. So this is all very, very standard ways of addressing palliative care. Okay. There's so nothing out of ordinary here. Let me go here then. So we're going from 50 to 75, and then we go to 100, right? 100, we're, we're keeping to elevate it because her pain is yeah, not controlled. This is right? what he's doing. This is okay. nice. Stop, both of you. This poor lady is taking down the testimony. Let her finish her question, then you can answer. Okay. And as you're jumping on top of each other, we can't sure. have it. She needs to make a record. And you know what I'll do, Your Honor? I'll start every question with yes or no, and hopefully that will help things go along. Uh, yes or no. With respect to uh, less than 15, well, 15, 20 minutes later, 100 micrograms of fentanyl per hour is ordered. Correct, right? yes. So even within that 15 increment, it was clear that the patient needed more, correct? Yes. And then here, we've got another increase, right, to 150. Right. Then we've got an increase here to what? What does this say? Um, four, 492. Right. It says 492. But I see, I see a five ml per hour. I don't know the dose. Doctor, just yeah. I'll, I'll be clear with my questions, and then that'll help us get along. And again, this was on the tenth, right? So yes. that's all the fentanyl she's getting on the tenth. And then this is where I I skipped the. Uh, so we've got two Mars from the tenth, and now I skipped the second Mar Joint Exhibit 12, page 920 to 922. This is the eleventh. We haven't yet talked about this day. We've talked about the tenth and the thirteenth, but I I want to talk about the eleventh. Um, we have got so new day. We've got uh, 125 micrograms per hour. Correct. Correct. And then we've got uh, the vasopressor here. Right, yes. Okay. Keeping her alive, would you agree? That's what a vasopressor does? Yes, yes. And then we've got uh, more fentanyl, yes. right? And then we've got here uh, 75 micrograms an hour of fentanyl, correct? Going down to 75. Yep. And then I want to note, if we can, as to the, uh, looking for a pain indication here, and I should just say, again, who's the ordering physician with respect to uh, this fentanyl order? Or Dr. These? Hagers. Dr. Hagers. And then um, we've got the continued use of fentanyl to uh, manage the pain, do we not, throughout the, the 11th? Yes. And these, again, um, assuming there's only one ICU doctor working at any night shift, 
Um, these orders were uh, by Dr. Hagris, correct? Correct. Okay. So over the course of the day on 11 10, 11 11, 11 12, and then 11 13, which is the day of her death, she has gotten on a continuous basis, has she not, either fentanyl or morphine? Yes. And so, and we know based on the pain scales that throughout much of that time, as indicated by the medical records, she continued to have pain, correct? Right. Yes. Then we have um, here with 1113, we have the 1,000 micrograms of fentanyl, and this order, as you know, was associated with the uh, palliative extubation. Is that correct? Yes. And this order is Dr. Hughes. And that's not a drip, that's a push of one dose. Right. And we, well, we know that there were other pushes ordered, right? We, yeah, we, okay. 50, 175. Right. So, so push, is, push is something that, um, that a doctor can order. You can order a push over three to five minutes. You could order a push regular. You could order or titrate it. Could you not? Yes. Okay. And so this is a thousand that's ordered uh, here. Is, would you agree with me on that? Yes. So, and I'm not going to force you to do the exact math, but if we were to add 1110, 1111, 1112, and 1113, and we know continuously she's getting micrograms of fentanyl and or morphine every hour right. for three days, 72 hours, I'll even say 60 hours, right? Yes. Okay. And 60 hours where she's getting those drugs put into her system is thousands yes, of definitely. micrograms of fentanyl. Is yes. It yes. yes, it is. patient James Allen. Um, again, States Exhibit 30, your report. Um, tell me if there's ever anything that you need to look at, by the way. Uh, this is a patient we already covered as well. You know what, it's, it's sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but I'm not covering uh, territory that I already have. So I just want to go here with respect to your mention of DNRCC. Um, you would agree with me that in terms of code status, DNRCCA means do not resuscitate comfort care arrest, correct? Yeah, I don't use those terms CCA and CC. That's pretty specific to this hospital. Okay. So then based on your review and work on behalf of the state of Ohio, did you come to know that within the hospital system, CCA Yes, I did. And did you also then learn through your work with the state of Ohio that CC means comfort care? Yes. Yet I just note in your report, and DNRCC is not so, uh, not something you use at, at Vanderbilt. Correct. Um, because I note in your report that you indicate that the goal of DNRCC is symptom management for best quality of life. Do you see how you write that? Yes. And fair to say, you write that almost in every patient's review. Do you not? Yes. Something you kind of repeatedly say. That's right. Um, and putting aside what codes you use at Vanderbilt or what codes you might know other hospitals use, Mount Carmel West, when you saw CC, it meant comfort care. That's right. So, I want to talk to you about this sentence right here, where you said that Mr. Allen remains stable in the ICU. 
and his body accepted the treatment provided up until his death. Do you see that in number seven? Yes, I do. Okay. We have, as you I'm sure recall because you reviewed his medical records, Mr. Allen had four organs that were shutting down on him, correct? That's right. He was on vasopressors, correct? Right. He's on a ventilator. Yep. Um, and your conclusion with respect to seven was that his he was stable. Well, I was referring, do you want me to explain what I meant by that? Well, I'll leave with yes or no. Yes or no, with respect to number seven, you indicated, did you not, Mr. Allen remained stable in the ICU and his body accepted the treatment provided up until his death. That's what yes. you Okay. And then I want to go down here where you indicate there is no clinical basis to remove Mr. Allen's breathing tube. Do you see that sentence? Yes. Uh, you would agree with me that separate from one another are indication and consent? Yes. Uh, indication is on the physician side. Consent is on the durable power of attorney kin side. Right. Putting aside indication, if the family next of kin, durable power of attorney, makes the decision to palliatively extubate an individual, yes. That's what has to happen. Yeah, I agree. And I disagree with the sentence that I wrote. You disagree with it? That's right. Okay, so I, I, I think I, I think that if the family had just made this decision for the patient, that that's a fine and operative thing to do if they judged it inappropriate for that person's quality of life. Okay, so that we can take out. Correct. And just so we're clear, showing you what's been marked as. Joint exhibit. Oh. One moment. I want to show you because we're on the discussion of what the family decided for Mr. Allen. Joint exhibit eight. <coughs> Okay, yes. Patient's family again was contacted. Uh, do these look like James Allen records right, yes. to you? Okay. Uh, personally spoke with son, daughter, and grandson outside of the room and updated on patient con conditions. Do you see this? That's right. And I'm assuming based on your review of the records that you reviewed this information um, that the patient does not want to remain on ventilator for a long period of time if he is able to come out of it. Do you see that? Yes. And that is a doctor other than Dr. Husel, correct? Dr. Patel. Yes. And then, as records do, they, they chronologically evolve, correct? That's right. It says right here, does it not, different physician, he, we can assume that's Mr. Allen, is on maximum support, and we have explained to his family are doing really can for him. Unfortunately, I am afraid he will not survive this episode. Right. And again, this is a doctor different from Dr. Husel. Correct. And this note is made on what date does it appear? The 20, the 28th. And then following page, different doctor yet, family was updated by the ICU team. Good, yes. So it seems, does it not, that this family, and this physician note, his family reports he's been very weak. This is when he first came in. Do you see that? Yes. So it seems as if, does it not, that the family of Mr. Allen is being updated uh, by, a, by multiple different doctors as to his status. Right. During his time at Mount Carmel West. Yes. And based on that, you know, based on your review of the medical records, that his family made the decision to palliatively extubate him. Yes. Withdrew, withdrawing consent, and then a, there is no choice by a physician at that point. They must do as the dur durable power of attorney or next of kin has ordered. Right. And it seems like everybody was on the same page team was with that decision. about 
uh, if we can, uh, Brandy McDonald. Um, okay. Again, showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 30. This is your report with respect to Ms. McDonald. Um, I just want to note, and you have included in your report under three, that uh, the family, when they decide to, to uh, initially go to DNR CCA, they indicate, do they not, they do not want heroic measures should patient have a cardiac arrest. <laughs> Right. Right. But they want to try other measures, including dialysis. Do you see this? Yes. And um, if I were to tell you that January 14th, um, it's we know that it's three days after um, three days after her admission to Mount Carmel. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So they're saying that let's let's try dialysis and and see if it works. Fair to say, right? Yes. Okay. With respect to Miss McDonald, showing you what's been marked as Joint Exhibit 5, page 283, does this, uh, what? Yes. It appears to be Miss McDonald's medical record? Right. Okay. And I'm assuming since you reviewed her file, you, you saw this? Yes. Okay. I want to go down here to the bottom and tell me. Um, I can zoom in. Does that help you? Right. Systolic blood pressure in the 80s. CRRT stopped. Means that they stopped. They tried dialysis. CRT is continuous renal replacement therapy, so it's a form of dialysis. And they've, they've decided to stop that because their blood pressure got too low. And I, I, I want to back up. Appreciate you going to the end, but they start it, do they not, at 1335, and she immediately is hypertensive. So they have to stop it, do they not? They, that's good. They tried what the family asked for, but she didn't tolerate it. She just couldn't tolerate it. That's and then, to, because this is such a, this is a critical situation, they tried it again, did they not, at 1440. They, this being the dialysis, second attempt. Right. And then you can see from 1459 that her blood pressure is in the 40, and it again doesn't work. Correct. Dialysis just doesn't work. And showing you what's been marked is Joint Exhibit 5, page 406. Um, do you remember seeing handoff forms in the medical yes. records? And fair to say a handoff form is, is uh, information that passes from one shift to another so that there isn't a gap in care? Correct. And this handoff form, does it not, um, talks about the dialysis attempts. Do you see where my finger is here yes. where it says Prisma? Yes. So pr it says, does it not, Dr. Prisma attempted two times today. Patient's blood pressure did not tolerate taken down. Did you see that? Yes. Okay. And then it goes on, code status change to DNR CCA. And the handoff note reads, does it not, family at bedside, vasopressors are maxed at max of 50 uh, micrograms. Do you see that? Yes. And then she's given bicarb. That's another vasopressor, is it not? Right. And she's unresponsive, no cough, no gag. Do you see that? Yes. And then the lactic number of 27, that's, that's critical, isn't it? Yes, it is. And then we've got the pH of 6.9. Right. Same thing, 6.9, about as low as you can go. Yes. And this is with respect to Brandy McDonald. Right. <clears throat> and I mention this because you would agree that doing dialysis, <clears throat> and dialysis is because she's, her kidneys are shutting down. That's right. They're failing her. Yes. Right? Doing dialysis is a curative measure. No. You wouldn't agree with that? No. It certainly is, under these situations, a life-saving measure that was attempted to be done, was it not? It was a temporizing measure. It was not a life-saving measure. Okay. Um, they were trying to buy time. They were buying time. The patient, wanted, they, wanted to, they wanted to have time with her if they could, and that's why they said, let's see what can go happen for 48 to 72 hours. So the family was hoping for some time. And, and the dialysis two times didn't work? 
Yeah, so they, they, they tried, but they did not get what they were hoping for. And sometimes that happens in medicine. Yeah. They were hopeful for a time, but they weren't going to get it from dialysis. Dialysis wasn't going to help. And, and just so we're clear, you never spoke to Ms. McDonald's family. You're just reading. I'm just using the chart. Yeah. I want to go back, if we can, to Ryan Hayes, a patient that we spoke about. And, and we'll just talk about him briefly. Um, because I remember during um, the last time you and I had an opportunity to talk that I had asked you about carfentanil. Do you remember that? Yes. And if you knew the difference between carfentanil and fentanyl. Yep. Okay. And did you have an opportunity to look that up? Yeah, I, you asked me earlier if I did any research. That, that I did look up, yeah. Okay. So carfentanil is a very potent, and I had never heard of carfentanil before you asked me about it. But other, than, other than, yeah. So carfentanil is a very, very potent synthetic derivative of fentanyl. So it's a kissing cousin of fentanyl that's super dangerous. Super dangerous. Yeah. And it is. is so much, is fentanyl. It's much stronger, yes. is it not, based on what you've learned since you were last year, than yeah. just fentanyl. That's right. But I remember your testimony that there were kissing cousins, so I wanted to review this. Yes. Okay? Good. So, Good. Now, so now that we've... I'm oh, sorry. It's okay. Sorry. I didn't hear what you just said, Doctor. I said go for it. And if you would please let her finish your question. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So now that you have a better understanding of um, the strength of carfentanil versus fentanyl, I want to just show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 18P. Just generally, doctor, um, from your experience and, and time as a physician, I, I assume that you've had an opportunity to review a toxicology report before. Yes. Okay. And um, let me take you back to your report because I want to make sure that we're tracking the dates. Okay. Does it appear from your report that um, Ryan Hayes uh, was was pronounced deceased on 23:30 of April 3rd? Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we're we're not misrepresenting dates. And then if we could go to this toxicology report of Mr. Hayes, do you say do you see this right here? Uh, blue top blood, April 2nd of 2017. Do you see that? Yes. And with respect to carfentanil, is it, what's the mark there? It's positive. So fair to say that before Mr. Hayes was extubated, when he came into the hospital, he had carfentanil in his system. Right, yes. And I bring this up because as I was reviewing my notes, I saw that you mentioned that 1,000 micrograms in the reference to what could kill an elephant. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. We know now, based on that toxicology report and your review of his records, that this individual came in to the hospital with carfentanil in his system, and he was able to be revived, right, and um, sustained, albeit on a ventilator, for some period of time. Yes. So even that carfentanil that's much stronger than fentanyl didn't take that man out. That's right. Did you see when you were looking up carfentanil that it's often used as an elephant tranquilizer? Yes. Just briefly <clears throat> touch on Beverly Schertzinger. Um, I just mentioned this right here in your report. Um, you, you discussed the biopsy um, that was done on this patient. Do you recall this in your report? Yes. Okay. And then you indicate that um, curative measures were not exhausted for this patient, 
Right. And then you, you, you talk about the estimated life expectancy of one to two years based on the biopsy results that came back post-mortem. Do you remember including that in your report? Yes, I did. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to make sure we're clear, though, uh, as to that biopsy. Okay. So the results of a biopsy estimating any life expectancy for her did not, by definition, take into account that she was on three different vasopressors, correct? Right. She had significant uh, health issues other with her organs other than um, her cancer, correct? Right. She had a blood pressure of 38 over 21. Do you remember that? Yes. And that's incredibly low, is it not? Yes. I, I mean, when I say incredibly low, basement? Basement. Basement. Um, and it also doesn't take into account that, again, this was a patient whose family had made the decision to palliatively extubate her. Correct? Correct. The family decisions. And I know you reviewed the records. Uh, and we would agree, would we not, that all 14 of these patients uh, were palliative extubation. Right. And we know in order to do a palliative extubation at Mount Carmel in Ohio, uh, there needs to be consent Once that decision is made by them, the physician can no longer treat and must do the extubation. Correct. It's a, a team decision, and he, the, the physician then follows through on that decision. Right. Follows through on that decision that the family's made. Yes. I want to talk to you about the family decisions because on your direct exam when you were last here, you, um, you made some statements about why... should never be done at night. Do you remember that? I don't remember using the word never. If I did use the word never, that's too strong of a word. Okay. Because so, I have done them at night in my, in, in my care as well. What I, what I was getting at was that it's hard on families routinely to do things like that at night and generally I like to do them in the light of day when people can get their rest and come to the hospital having gathered themselves a bit. Okay. But I, I think never is too strong of a word, so I would take that back. Okay. And so you like to do it when they can get their rest and gather together. Then let me just ask you about your, you know that um, in the Ryan Hayes case, for instance, the decision was made to extubate during the day and then it was waited until the nighttime only so the sun could arrive. Do you remember that fact? I mean, generally, what we're trying to do here is do what's best for the patient and the family. And those circumstances can vary depending upon individual situations. If there's a son coming in, let's wait. Okay. So that so, might be a factor in some decisions to do them at night. So I want to go back because you said you want the family to rest and to gather. Showing you what's been marked is joint exhibit five. I'm going to go through the records with respect to the family. Okay. Okay? For each patient. So I'll be quick, but I want to make sure that we're hitting on the, the family decision in each of these 14 cases. Uh, joint Exhibit 5 with respect to Brandy McDonald. Um, discussed, with, uh, discussed her progress with, with family this far. Correct? Yes. Called to bedside to discuss code status with family. Wishes are for comfort care at this time. Code status change. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Ms. Manashi, help me out. Yeah. When you keep switching documents, refer to the document, please. Um, it's so the second page. 
it's the, the second, second page. page of the same exhibit. Fine. I put it as the same exhibit. That's fine. Okay, it's the same exhibit. The family documents for Brandy McDonald. I just want to, so the Court of Appeals can know what we're doing. Okay. Well, hopefully they. I don't hope anything for that. Right. Okay. So second page, code status change, correct? Yes. Okay. Physician is calling family. Do you see that note? Yes. Okay. I want to just go back to this when the code status has changed, right? And then this note about the family. Yes. With respect to Brandy McDonald, fair to say nowhere in any progress note, uh, physician note, attending note, discharge summary note, did it say that her family needed more rest or time to gather? I don't see that. Moving to Francis Burke, Joint Exhibit 6. <coughs> this highlighted sentence right here, Dr. Reeds, does it not? The family elected to, to withdraw care due to the severe findings and worsening neurologic exam. Do you see that? Yeah, it's actually a pet peeve of mine. Okay. And it says withdraw care, and I don't like to say that we ever withdraw care. We withdraw support. We well, always care. Every, every doctor does it a bit different, don't they? I mean, in fact, I, I, you've written some articles, have you not, doctor, about how medicine is in part an art form? Yes. <clears throat> and this is uh, Wagner is the MD here? Right. So, family elected. Nothing in this note with respect to Francis Burke indicates that the family needed more rest or time to gather, correct? Right. And this right here, note with respect to Francis Burke, is there is the waiting for the family to arrive. Yes, good. And same thing with Francis Burke um, here, again, Closser, so a doctor other than uh, William Hussle, would you agree with me on that? Yes. Family meeting held. Doctor shows them the CT image. And he emphasizes, does he not, the massiveness of the stroke. Right. Will ultimately lead to a brain stem herniation, which will cause her to go into cardiac arrest. And then Dr. Klosser indicates, does he not, the family does not want patient to receive chest compressions, which they know she would not want. Understandable, her, con er, her condition is irreversible. They understand that her condition is irreversible. That's a doctor's note from a doctor other than William Hussle, correct? Yes. Code status change. Again, nothing in Francis Burke's record where there are family notes. Does it ever say that the family of Francis Burke wanted more rest or time to gather, correct? It does not say that. And this progress note with respect to Francis Burke is a note from Dr. Husel, about Dr. Husel, written by another nurse. Dr. Husel conversed with family at bedside. Decision to withdraw care per family and Dr. Husel. Medications given, ETT removed, patient comfortable with family at bedside. Chaplain Page, do you see that note from the nurse? Yes, good. Jeremiah Hodge, Joint Exhibit 7. Right here, conversations with uh, family. Initially, Code Blue was called. However, after discussions with family members, and do you see that discussions is in, uh, is in plural there? Yes. And this is a different doctor writing this than Dr. Husel, correct? Right with family members and Dr. Husel, the critical care physician. There was a decision made to perform a palliative withdrawal and code status changed to DNR comfort care. Do you see that? Yes. And it indicates large family at bedside. Yes. So with respect to your concern about a family being able to gather, it seems with respect to Jeremiah Hodge that the family was gathered. Yes, good. 
Troy Allison, join exhibit nine. Right here. What doctor's writing this note? Patel. What this highlighted sentence says does not. Patient died prior to being seen as per family's request to withdraw care. Do you see this? Yes. Okay. This is Troy Allison. Family decided to withdraw care. Yes. This note. Does it not with respect to Troy Allison? After the patient arrested for the second time, his family was brought back to the ER, and I explained to them everything that was going on with the patient. At that time, they informed me that the patient was not very, it says complaint, but, <laughs> oh no, it says compliant, sorry. So this is another, this is a discussion that's also happening with the family in the ER. Would you agree with me? Yes. With respect to Troy Allison. And then here, patient's condition did not stabilize, and team informed the family that patient could not survive his current condition. Do you see that? Yes. And would you agree with me that that individual that wrote that patient assessment is not Dr. Husel? Yes. Time spent in minutes, 150. Do you see that? Yes. The spiritual care note. So the chaplain is there. Yes. And inform the family. Family opted to withdraw the ventilation support, knowing this family did not wish to be on life support. Do you see that? Yes. At no point in time does it say in any medical record with respect to Troy Allison that the family wanted rest or time to gather, correct? Right. Bonnie Austin, join exhibit 10. Seems as if Bonnie Austin has her family and friends at the bedside. Does she not, doctor? Yes. Family has decided to de-escalate care. And you see that friends is plural there, correct? Yes. What does this note say right here? I see team and chaplaincy working with family. And so we've got a spiritual care provider and we've also got a team of individuals from the ICU. Right. Right down here again, uh, the no family and friends at bedside, correct? Yes. Just want to show you for sake of completeness, the history and physical, a decision to withdraw care has been made by family at bedside. They state, and it's quoted, is it not, she would not want to live like this. Yes. Critical care, managing care, discussed care, and plan to withdraw care. Do you see that? Yes. And that note is made, is it not, by someone other than Dr. Husel? Yes. Again, with respect to Bonnie Austin, nothing in the medical records indicate that her family needed more rest or more time to gather before she was palliatively extubated. Yes. James Timmons, joint exhibit 11. This is the discharge summary, is it not? Yes. Indicates that the family decided to change the code status to DNR comfort care. Do you see that, doctor? Yes. This is James Timmons. Um, this note right here, this is Dr. Husel's note, is it not? Yes. And it says overnight the patient remained severely acidotic and on maximal doses of vasopressors. Do you see that? Yes. Family updated at bedside. Decision was made by family to change code status to DNRCC. Yes. And then I want to go here that there's even family notes within James Timmons' records, are there not, about the patient's brother's calling. So there's even contact with other family members outside the state. Do you see yes. that? And it looks, does it not, as if the spiritual time, the spiritual staff spent with the Timmons family was 60 minutes. Yes. I apologize for the poor copy. 
up. And then there's more spiritual time of 20 minutes. Do you see that, doctor? Yes. Again, apologies. Um, and then it looks, if, it's, if here, does it not, that the brother Lynn was contacted by doctor for consent to do the procedure. Do you see that? Yes. So there's even communications about this with outside, uh, those that are located outside. Yes. And it says, because with respect to Mr. Timmons, the patient's only available family is his brother. Right. And then it goes on, does it not, to say both the patient and his brother have social and emotional issues, right? Yes. And that they have a fractured relationship. But even with their fractured relationship, the hospital staff is making efforts to, to make contact. Yes. And I'm sure based on your testimony direct, during direct, you're glad to see that. I am. And patient's brother and sister-in-law are present. Yes. And then there's an urging patient's brother to help locate the patient's son. Yes. See that? Fair to say, and then another 30 minutes of, of what they call at Mount Carmel West death support, which is the chaplain being there with the family and right. friends, right? Fair to say um, that then the final is family wish to change the code status to DNR comfort care. Dr. Husel is at bedside as, as a witness. Do you see that? Yes. And that note is not by Dr. Husel, that's by an RF. Right. So with respect to Mr. Timmons, there's nothing in the medical records, would you agree, that indicates that uh, the family wanted more time to rest or additional time for others to gather? No. Showing you what's been marked as Joint Exhibit 13, Rebecca Walls. This is the discharge summary, uh, fair to say? Yes. And it indicates, does it not, the family was called to the bedside to discuss code status, and in the end, they did change her to a DNRCC, and she died at 1.32 in the morning with her family present. Do you yes. see that? I want to go now kind of back in time. Plan, long discussion with patient and friend's family by bedside, explained risks of dialysis and need being high. The need of the dialysis being high. Is that how you interpret that? Yes. Okay. And this is again for Rebecca Walls. Yes. So there's a conversation um, with the family, <clears throat> and that's from a doctor other than Dr. Husel, correct? Right. And then, um, and then the family's decision called to bedside to, to, to discuss code status, family in agreement, DNRCC, patient pronounced deceased. Do you see that? Yes. And then we've got in other medical records notes about family significant other updated. Do you see that? Yes. So there's communication with family members going on between the hospital staff and family. Yes. It appears from the medical records. And then just going down here, uh, spiritual care staff, it appears 45 minutes and I'm sorry for the poor copy I can approach if you want. Uh, Can you see that, Doctor? I'm not sure. Yes, yes. Okay. It, it indicates, does it not, the patient's friend and MHPOA were present at the bedside. Code status was changed to DNR. Jana is trying to reach the patient's cousins, her only blood relatives. Do you see that note? Yes. And, this, and the chaplain has spent 45 minutes. Correct? Yes. And this note is um, on uh, 11, well, it's entered on 11 uh, 19. Do you see that? Yes. So this is, again, more communication with at least the, the patient's friend, who's also, it appears, to be her um, durable power of attorney. Yes. So by law, the patient's friend is actually the one that can make the decision with respect to palliative excavation, correct? Yes. And we know from this record that she's present at bedside of Miss Walls. Yes. Nothing in, um, and then I want to make sure I show you this. Another 180 minutes. Fair to say that patient was extubated and died surrounded by three of her best friends. You see that? Yes. Okay, again. 
page references, please. That was all one exhibit, Your Honor. Okay. With respect to Rebecca Walls, it was joint exhibit 13. <laughs> and there are various pages you showed during the exhibit. You want I'm just to letting the Court of Appeals know that you showed more than one page. <laughs> sure, and every page is marked. Okay. Uh, doctor, same question, uh, but different patient, Rebecca Walls, who died with her three best friends there. You would agree that nothing there says that uh, the family or friends or her power of attorney needed additional time to rest or gather or eat or sleep? I did not see that. Yes. Melissa Penix. Showing you what's been marked as joint exhibit 14. Every page is numbered. This is the discharge uh, summary. Just, just recognize that yes. as a discharge summary. This appears, as, as you know from the course of your practice, or maybe just from your work in this case, uh, the discharge summary in Ohio is done by the attending physician. Is that correct? Yes. And the attending physician for Ms. Penix was a doctor other than Dr. Husel, right? Correct. It says, does it not, by the attending physician, I was in contact with the family every day as her clinical condition never began to improve. Do you see that? Yes. The family gathered at bedside after we had to transfer her to the unit and intubated her and decided that she would not have wanted to be put on a ventilator. Yes. Do you see on the discharge summary written by her attending physician, she died with her family at bedside? Yes. Again, called to bedside to discuss code status with family members. Do you see that uh, note by Dr. Husel? Yes. All family members in agreement with DNRCC, patient palliatively extubated. Would you agree with me that as written by Dr. Husel, it indicates that members is plural? Yes. Which is consistent with that discharge summary I just sent you, is it not? Yes. And then here on a direct charting flow sheet for Ms. Penix, same exhibit, Your Honor. Um, Family notified of condition change. Do you see this? Patient family questions addressed, and they're updated on the plan of care. Yes. So it appears with respect to Ms. Penix, based on the medical records, that there is at least daily communication with the family about her status. Do you see that? Yes. And then in addition to the attending physician talking to the family daily, do you see this note here that I'm sure you reviewed that said this RN attempted to reach each family by phone to give updates? Yes. And that's a good, that's, that's good practice, is it not? It's really good practice. Kind of going... Um, and then we've got this nursing note here, patient quickly decompensated with elevated lactate and need for max dose pressors. And the note reads, does it not, family decided to change code status to DNR comfort care and requested a palliative withdrawal. Do you see that? Yes. Same thing with respect to Ms. Penix, Melissa Penix. Um, now that we've had a chance to review those documents in Joint Exhibit 14, there's no notes in the medical records that her family um, desired more rest or time to gather before their decision to palliatively extubate her. That's right. While you're exchanging, Sam, are you doing okay? Yes. Pace has been furious. One moment. <clears throat> sake. Showing the witness what's been marked as joint exhibit one, page 250 to 251. This appears to belong to patient Belisari, does it not? Yes. And uh, does this appear Dr. Moody entered a family meeting note? Do you see that? Yes. And the family meeting note 
from uh, Dr. Moody reads, does it not, with respect to the family, that she met with the patient's brother, sister, sister-in-laws, and lifetime friend. Yes. You see that? And then it goes on to say about how Dr. Moody explained um, her current medical state um, and uh, her progressive kidney disease, and the family indicated Right, that she never wanted to be resuscitated with CPR. Um, or actually, this was a family member that indicated that she never wanted to be resuscitated with CPR after witnessing her mom's resuscitation. Do you see that? Right. And then it goes on um, to, to indicate, to that end, we have decided to continue ventilation through the weekend, right? And right. then discuss extubation um, after some time has passed, and, and this relates to the um, dialysis, does it not? Yes. So this is another situation, right, where her family is having discussions um, with doctors other than Moody about the patient's uh, critical state. Yes. And tell me, with respect to Ms. Belisari, fair to say that there was no note in any medical record belonging to her that prior to her family making the decisions to palliatively extubate her, that they needed more rest or time to gather um, or sleep. Right. Okay. And same thing, I know we've covered Ryan Hayes, showing you Joint Exhibit 2, page 22. Uh, Mr. Hayes was... Um, was the uh, situation that came in as an OD overdose situation. Do you recall that? Clinically ill, poor prognosis, met with husband, mother, and father. They do not want heroic measures. Should patient have another cardiac arrest? <laughs> right? But then they talk about dialysis if it's a possibility. Right. Doesn't improve. And then we, of course, know what happens with Brandy McDonald in terms of, um, or I'm sorry, I just went from Danny to, to Brandy McDonald. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I'll start with go back to Danny Millett. Same thing with Danny Millett as to his family. No indication that they needed additional rest or, or time to gather, right? That's right. Okay. And Brandy McDonald, apologies, we've already covered. So I think I think I've covered the 14, and, and even if I hadn't, again, you would agree with me that uh, that there are a number of notes in each of the 14 patient files from nurses, chaplains, physicians that time was spent with each and every one of the family members or friends for these patients. Correct? Yes. Few more questions, but first, one moment. Uh, a few other just kind of quick hit questions. Um, did you review, um, and I'm assuming you did it because you didn't. I don't recall. But you do know that not just at Mount Carmel West, but that there is no maximum dosage with respect to fentanyl and palliative care. Is that correct? As I said earlier, the, the maximum dose is what would in somebody's life stop stop them from breathing. So wow. there's not a number, but yes, we right. that's why we go low and build up slowly without jumping 10, 20 times higher than previous doses. Understand your answer about what your practice is. And that's standard, that's standard and documented in the medical literature. It's not just my practice. Yes. Okay, yes. folks, she asks questions, you answer the questions. So there's no maximum dose, right? There's no, there's no uh, established ceiling that is a specific number, correct? I, as I said, the established ceiling is yes. what stops somebody from I'll breathing. Take, I'll, take the, sorry, I'll take the hint on not asking a clear yes or no question. Mount Carmel West, 2013 to 2018. There's no maximum dose policy with respect to using fentanyl during a palliative excavation, correct? I don't think so. Your Honor, I'm going to object. He said he did not review policies. Well, he said he didn't remember if he reviewed policies. So I'll let it stand. You have redirect to clear it up. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I just want to go back, uh, critical care doctors, there's different pathways someone can become a critical care physician, correct? Correct. And your pathway was through pulmonology or internal medicine? 
it does. And you, uh, there is a different pathway, is there not, to become a critical Half of them go through anesthesia. And, and then where does that leave internal medicine if it's half? Uh, those are internal medicine. If you go through pulmonary, you do internal medicine for three years first, and then you do three years of pulmonary and critical care. Whereas anesthesia, people just go straight into anesthesia without doing internal medicine. Okay, right. And this is my point. Anesthesia and internal medicine, right, are different pathways. Yes. Right? Um, and are you aware what Dr. Hussle's pathway was? Anesthesia, I believe. And... talk about a few, uh, two other things with respect to your things that you've authored. You're familiar, um, obviously, with the ICU liberation bundle, A through F. Are you not, Dr. Yes, that's and kind of my, my thing that I came up with. You came letters. up with it. Well, I started, I, I came up with the idea to put letters to that, and I was the chair of the ICU Liberation Committee for the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And assuming since you came up with it, you have, you're familiar with, um, with what the A through F stands for, are you not? Yes, I, I wrote that. So I'm showing you, and I've shown the prosecutor, Your Honor, what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit Eli 20. Does this appear to look familiar to you, doctor? Yes, that's the ICU liberation bundle. And this is an explanation of the bundle, is it not? Yes. And um, this is available online? Yes. And I want to just go down here um, so that the jury can track that it indicates that the bundle consists of the following ind individual elements. Do you see that word there? Yes, this is, this is a, a safety checklist. It's how pilots get across the country in airplanes. This is how we get across safely in the ICU with our patients. Right, because this bundle could be applied, as you state in your articles, to anyone that's within the ICU, correct? And we apply it sometimes on the floor as well. Okay. So I want to just talk about element A, which says assess, prevent, and manage pain. Okay. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Just if I could direct your attention to this line right here with respect to introduction of element A. Would you agree with me that that sentence says... Inability to communicate verbally does not negate the possibility that a patient is experiencing pain. That's right. And then assessment, and this goes back to A, does it not? The A element? Yes. Okay. We talk here. Pain affects most ICU patients. Do you see that? Yes. And then it goes on to say, does it not, that patients with diminished communication, which being on a ventilator, by definition, I would have diminished communication. Would you agree? Yeah. Or cognitive capabilities, and I can assume you mean diminished cognitive capabilities. Yes. Are at risk of experiencing higher levels of pain. Do you see that? Yes. And that's, that's what we worry about. Would you agree with me? talk about diminished cognitive capabilities. In our case, in our case, but 14 cases, Ryan Hayes had anoxic, anoxic brain injury. Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> Sandra Castle had anoxic brain injury. Yes. You would agree that's diminished right. capabilities. James Allen had dementia. Right. Diminished capabilities. Bonnie Austin had a Glasgow score of a three. Yes. And you, I remember, testified that three is the lowest Glasgow score you That's right. Joanne Belisari had a Glasgow score of a three. Yes. Francis Burke had a Glasgow score of a three. 
Yes. Jeremiah Pahar had a Glasgow score of a three. Yes. Brandy McDonald had a Glasgow score of a three. Yes. Danny Millette had a Glasgow score of a three. Yes. Rebecca Walls had a Glasgow score of a six. Yes. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten patients, um, and you that, that indicated uh, diminished capacity. Yes. And then lastly, I just want to note this line here under assessment. It assessment is suggested in this order. Do you see that? Yes. Attempt to obtain patient self-report. Yes. Of course, but but if I'm on a if I'm on a, someone's on a ventilator, that's nearly impossible. Difficult to do, yeah. Okay. Then you look for behavioral changes. Right? That's right. That's why we use the CPOT, because it doesn't require the person talking. Right. And the CPOT, and you also talk about the NARS and the BIPs, right? Yes. Okay. I and think then, on some occasions people were using other than the CPOT when they used the 10 or something. That's what I'm assuming. Right. And then ask the family to help identify pain behaviors. Do you see that? Yes. So it would be important to you if the family were to have told the nurse, my loved one is in extreme pain. Yeah, we should pay attention to that. If somebody's telling us they think there's pain, the family's probably a better judge of that than, than I am. And then I want to go back because this, um, this instrument, the bundle, is used in the ICU, but now you've indicated other areas. The fourth is assume that pain is present. Do you see that? Yes. as to sort of uh, your practice and what things you find to be the biggest barrier. I wanted to talk to you about the third question you were asked um, and, and answered. Did you not? These are your answers in this article? Yes. Okay. I want to make sure of that. And again, this is Defendant's Exhibit Eli 23. What do you most often wish that you could say to patients that don't? Or, but don't. Do you see that question? Yes. And your first sentence, is it not, you wrote, you look at these people suffering, and I've always wanted to tell them how the suffering they're going through is helping me as a person. Yeah. Nothing further. Ms. Sawyer, how long do you think you have? Probably longer than 35 minutes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, they tried to get another witness in this afternoon. Let's do lunch now, and then we'll finish it up, okay? And unfortunately, we'll get to go home early, okay? Um, but in all fairness, they did make efforts to try to get another witness here. So we're not ignoring you or anything. We all still love you. Okay, so we want to make sure that this works smoothly. Let's take an hour for lunch, come back at 12.30, and continue on. Does that make sense to you all? Okay, have a great lunch. Remember the admonition.
Ms. Sawyer, anything for the record? No, Your Honor, nothing for the record. Ms. Menashe? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay. You guys take some time and inform the bailiff of what you guys want to do about a schedule. Okay? Doctor, remember my admonition before? You're free for lunch. Okay, thank you.